Uh, but it's uh, thanks so much for inviting me. And I'm gonna speak fast, but it's uh, it's a talk that's not gonna be heavy on uh, technique, but it's gonna be heavy a little bit on historic perspective. Uh, uh, these are my disclosures. And uh, uh, before I start talking about Reeves Stope and how we ended up going through history and where we are today, I really want to give a shout out to Dr. Ben David, uh, Guy Voller, for giving me some personal communications to give historic perspective of what happened, and also Alfie Corbinell, who shared some of the papers with me. But the story of Reef Sopa and the retro Moscow repairs really starts in Paris, where uh, two uh, gray guys uh, uh, independently uh, worked together to create, uh, sort of change the paradigm in repair. Not always a super friendly competition, but uh, always referencing each other. Uh, and it starts sometime in the late uh, 1960s, and uh, you can see uh, it all started off uh, Ingenol repairs. And uh, Stopa, uh, in this paper in 1973, had referenced his previous experience. And you can see using interposition of uh, mesh without fixation by the sub preperitoneal median route between the peritoneum and the muscles. And this was really uh, one of the earlier documentations of that space. Uh, uh, not too long after that, Reeves had published uh, uh, a paper on. Uh, essentially the same topic on eventrations. And you can see they, be they began to understand that the mesh placed as an inlay uh, is not going to be the ideal scenario because of the physics. They started talking about placements of uh, mesh prosthetics in the retromuscular space uh, and really uh, mentioning even uh, reconstruction selenial but restoring the anatomy if possible. Uh, uh, interestingly, some of the, you see the results were great. Uh, they follow patients very closely, reporting very, very good outcomes in subsequent uh, uh, in, uh, papers. Uh, this, uh, the difference between the two men was also that Stopa was, uh, uh, spoke English, uh, liked to travel, was uh, very friendly, and Reese was a little more reclusive, never traveled, uh, and didn't speak English. So first publication in the English literature from Stopa on this uh, topic appeared in the kind of late 80s about treatment of complicated groin and incisional hernias. Again, this is the pictures, the original photographs from, uh, from the drawings from that that demonstrate both concepts, the retromuscular repair within the rectus sheath and also the uh, preperitoneal repair uh, that was extended to, uh, all the way to the source muscles bilaterally. So in these papers, uh, they began to start making somewhat loud statements. You can see uh, Reeves, I'm sorry, Stopa had called recurrences uh, complications of suboptimal repairs. Uh, and also called uh, uh, to that the state of hernia surgery has advanced to the point that most must consider the systematic surgical cure of all diagnosed hernias. So really began to believe in he was doing in the durability of the repair and uh, subsequently really in the same paper proclaimed uh, s referencing reefs that he, uh, we should encourage experienced surgeons to use retromuscular prosthetics to repair not only large but all incisional hernias. So really contributing to the shift in paradigm for sure. Uh, he also said for ethical, professional, and economic reasons, these are the days of hernia surgery without recurrences. Enter George Wands, uh, an American surgeon from uh, New York who some people called an ambassador, an American ambassador to French surgeons. He frequently visited uh, Reeves and especially Stopa. He was really interested in disease and learned a lot from them. Uh, brought back the concept and published uh, a, a paper with, uh, titled Giant Prosthetic Reinforcement of the Visceral Sac, which was so often referred to. And also said, when correctly performed, prepared neal herniarophies should not recur. They should be all great. Uh, and uh, George Wands also uh, edited the first kind of really comprehensive atlas. You've seen those pictures or uh, variations of those pictures. And that was early 90s when uh, this began to sort of appear on the American soil. Eugene Mangianti, this is not the name I knew before I started to prepare for this talk, uh, a surgeon in Memphis who developed interest in hernia surgery, was uh, very, uh, uh, you know, intrigued by the repairs, had invited uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Wants to come give grand rounds. They collaborated together. And during that time, he had a very curious uh, surgical resident, uh, Guy Voller, who also took up some interest uh, to, hernia, uh, to hernia repairs, particularly retromuscular hernia repairs, and uh, together they started to really apply the techniques of Reef Stopa in their patients. They used the original sublate techniques of uh, prepared neural repair, 
but they also extended that to the underlay uh, and uh, uh, utilized it in open eye palm techniques, as already was mentioned by uh, Dr. Felix, but also gave rise to a laparoscopic venture hernia repair technique. They thought by utilizing uh, underlay meshes, they were really following the principles of reef stop, a giant prosthetic reinforcement of the visceral sac, and taught a lot of courses on lap venture hernia. During those courses, they would bring up the teachings of Reeves, Stopper, and Wands, and often show the pictures of, the, uh, of that atlas. And interestingly, uh, it's the arrival of laparoscopic surgery that brought the retromuscular and uh, 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 preperitoneal repairs uh, to, uh, to the United States. During that time of teaching those courses, they came across another young man, uh, Todd Hannaford, who also got interested in, in the repairs, not only laparoscopic repairs, but he also learned uh, preperitoneal uh, retrofascial mesh repair. And uh, from 2001, uh, had uh, started uh, uh, utilizing that uh, for his patients. When I was a fellow there, we looked at uh, his experience with those patients. You can see we found 34 patients who had uh, multiple recurrent hernias. And uh, there are interesting things in that paper. First of all, you can see we preferred the prepared neoplane. And in rare instances that the prepared neoplane could not be dissected free, the mesh was placed in the retroactive space anterior to the posterior fascia. Also, interestingly, uh, we did not talk too much about linear albert reconstruction. In fact, in that entire paper, the, the words linear albert did not appear. In fact, we said the midline fascia was closed when possible, really uh, putting heavy reliance on mesh as a strength layer. Uh, one of the trainees of Doc Hannaford, Dr. Uh, Alfredo Carbonell, uh, was a little bit dissatisfied with the challenges of prepared neal repair and uh, developed what he coined as posterior component separation during retromuscular repair. In fact, co coined this term. And uh, in his uh, uh, practice, he applied this to 20 patients when he, for the first time, uh, exited the posterior sheath through its lateral border into the lateral abdominal wall by uh, finding ways between the uh, transversus abdominis and uh, internal oblique to provide, again, stay to the principles of retromuscular repair and um, uh, uh, giant prosthetic reinforcement of the visceral sac. The few things that we know now, uh, one of them was the potential criticism of the technique was the fact that all the neurovascular bundles were divided. The truth is, the clinical significance of that is still questionable. You know, although we've never had reports of people getting paralysis of the abdomen or some really uh, bad outcomes related to that, today it's believed to be a, a bad thing to do. Alfie also in his paper brought something up. Why not access the space between the internal and external oblique, avoiding all these problems? And for all you young kids over there, that's not been done yet. If you're looking for something new to do, uh, you may want to explore that area. Okay? so. Up to that time, let me summarize a little bit. So we had classic reef stop or retromuscular dissection to the edge of the rectus sheath. Insufficient, it was really insufficient for large defects. Prepared needle technique, although durable uh, to provide enough space, was really not a reconstructive option. And once the lineal restoration was important, uh, there was not uh, sufficient. Intramuscular posterior component separation was uh, uh, good, but it uh, resulted in denervation of recti and potentially led to some muscle atrophy. Uh, when I was uh, uh, a young attending at the University of Connecticut, I w I did, I've done anatomic dissections, and uh, contrary to what's been propagated by Netter and, um, and, his, and many other masters of hernia surgery, you can notice the one thing that was depicted incorrect throughout the entire time, the fact that transverse abdominal muscle actually did not stop at the semilunar line and extended well beyond that in upper abdomen and, ex and ex actually extending all the way to the xiphoid process. Uh, and if, I, in fact, when I look back at some of the uh, uh, reef stopper pictures from our fellowship days, you can see the, uh, uh, the transverse abdominus was very visible there in a subcostal space. So the transverse abdominus release procedure, again, I don't have uh, too much time to talk about technique, but first was done in 2006 at the University of Connecticut. Uh, my first experience with that technique was detailed in uh, uh, Berlin at the combined AHS-AHS meeting. And guess what? It was not really met with great uh, fanfare. It was really met with skepticism. And in fact, uh, uh, several first drafts of this paper have been declined by several papers. And subsequently to moving to Cleveland, I was able to publish this in the American Journal of Surgery, uh, really performing, uh, reporting on my retrospective review of patients undergoing this repair 
uh, between January, December 2006, December 2009, uh, detailing 42 patients. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the technique again, but it's an extension of all the principles that we just talked about, uh, really extending what uh, Reefs of Stopper has done, restoring the visceral sac, providing the giant prosthetic reinforcement of the visceral sac, restoring the linear alba, uh, ventral to the mesh, and uh, providing a reliable repair. So the advantages are plainful, and again, they follow the principles that we learned from the great masters, the effective restoration of linear alba, giant reinforcement, no skin flaps, preservation of neurovascular bundles. It is safe, it is effective, it is now we're proving to be reproducible. And since that time, uh, we're very successful to now really accumulate the body of literature that details a variety of circumstances where the TAR technique could be successfully utilized and applied. And, um, uh, and remains to be uh, spread widely. Uh, but the reality is, uh, the, uh, since the description, the lion's share of this uh, uh, propagation belongs to Mike Rosen, Alfie Carbonell, Todd Hannaford, uh, people who uh, allowed this widespread uh, uh, teaching of this technique. And now that we have a number of uh, trainees in the younger generation that continues to apply TAR, the slide is not big enough to uh, put everybody. But this is, continues to be uh, a technique that evolves and, and is going to undergo many more changes. Uh, uh, yet to come. Uh, I want to reference Guy Waller here and mention uh, from his speech in 2012. He said, I'm a firm believer that we in surgery owe everything to those that go before us. This is especially true in the world of herniology. And it's very true. And when I look uh, at this last slide, I'd like to do something not traditional. I'd like for you guys to all get on your feet and honor with a moment of silence the great masters, Gene Reef and Reef Stolper, and join me in the moment of silence. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your patience.